Okay, good morning again. Uh, the story will start with this observation. When we look at the musculoskeletal evolution with aging, there are two processes. On the left hand side, the loss of muscle mass, and on the right hand side, the loss of bone mineral density taken as a reflection of the bone, min bone mass. But when you look at some function, strength and power is decreasing with a higher magnitude as compared with the mass regarding the muscle. And when you look at the bone strengths here calculated by finite element analysis, the decrease is of a higher magnitude as well. And this could be related to some component of bone strength which are not captured by the measurement of bone mineral density, which remains the uh, for the diagnosis of osteoporosis. And when you look at the bone, it's a bank coming from Switzerland. I cannot avoid to take this comparison. And it's a bank with a portfolio in which you have the mass, but several uh, structural component allowing the bone to be uh, good. And then you have an income, which is bone accrual, and you have some expenses, and this is bone loss. And what we are rapidly discussing today is how uh, the protein intake, particularly those of dairy origin, could affect both the accrual and the loss. First of all, the accrual. And here we have some uh, mechanism. We know that the gross hormone IGF-1 system is affecting not only the bone, but the muscle as well. And we know that the dietary proteins could influence the synthesis of IGF-1, not only at the liver level, but probably also at the peripheral uh, parenchymes and particular bone. And here we have, in addition, some specificity. We know that the synthesis of IGF-1 is related to some specific amino acid, the aromatic one, tryptophan, phenylalanine, whereas the branch one, like leucine, is directly affecting another mass, uh, muscle enzyme, which is related to muscle protein synthesis. And then the IGF-1 indirectly is stimulating the synthesis of uh, vitamin D, active vitamin D metabolites, ensuring enough calcium and phosphate to uh, mineralize the newly deposited bone. And then there are also data showing that the kidney is uh, responsive to IGF-1 with an increase in the renal tubular reabsorption of phosphate. But as you know, the growth is mostly genetically determined, and we are following a track which starts probably even before birth. But the effect of protein, in particular nutrition in general, is probably playing a role even before the conception, or at least during the pregnancy. And there are a few examples indicating that what the mother is eating during the pregnancy uh, or drinking in terms of dairy products is affecting the bone status even eight to nine years after the birth. Here are two examples, one from India showing that uh, milk intake during pregnancy is leading to better bone when the child is uh, eight to nine years of age. And the same is true uh, when there is some ev evaluation of the so-called prudent diet in which yogurt and cheese are included. But it seems that the uh, dairy product intake, even before the conception, could have an effect on the bone status of the child, allowing the child to take a better track than that one which would be just genetically determined. Then if we look at the relationship between the spontaneous uh, protein intake and the yearly growth, the yearly accumulation of bone mineral content at the lumbar spine level, if you take a population of adolescents between the age of 8 and 18 on the right hand side, there is no association. But suggesting maybe some window of opportunity, if you look at the left hand side and specifically to the chi children before puberty, in this case there is a positive relationship. The higher the protein intake, the higher the, uh, the increase in bone mineral content, and this remains after adjustment for the calcium intake, indicating that probably we are here facing a specific effect on the growth of the bone. But you will say these are association studies. What about intervention studies? And actually, we do not have some intervention studies specifically with proteins, but we have a large variety of different trials with dairy product and particular milk. And this is a list probably incomplete, but believe me, all of these data are positive. Milk, yogurt, 
cheese associated with a higher bone growth uh, as uh, evaluated with bone mineral density or even evaluated uh, looking at the size of the bone or at the cortical area. So it seems that there is some positive association. And conversely, there are a few examples that those kids avoiding dairy products are at higher risk of fracture. One study in New Zealand, uh, and probably the kids avoiding dairy products represent between 17 and 20% of the children in general, and those kids have a higher risk of fracture as compared with those taking regularly some dairy products. And this has been confirmed in Poland, the second example I'm giving, and particularly in the, in the girls, those with a milk-free diet have a 4.6 higher risk of having a fracture during the childhood and adolescence. So this was for the kids, and since we have to be a bit fast, now I'm skipping uh, the middle part of the life to go to the elderly. And you see here some observational study with a measurement of bone mineral density at the proximal liver level over a four-year period in, young, in normal elderly people with a normal diet. And when this diet is uh, distributed into quartiles according to the protein intake, you see that both in men and in women, those with a lower protein intake, Q1, as uh, suggested before by Dr. Wolf, have a, low, a higher loss of bone as compared with those in the Q4, those with a higher protein intake. But I like to emphasize these are not extreme. Those are normal people in the frame of the Framingham study, and there are not too many extreme in terms of protein intake. Then the question I was raising before, before it's a bone mineral density, but as we said, this does not capture all the component of bone strengths. So the next question was, is there some relationship between protein intake and specifically the milk or dairy products? And even in this uh, cross-sectional study, it was possible to record the yogurt intake, which represented approximately 5% of the total protein intake. And you see here a few data at the distal tibia. There's a positive association for total density cortical density, cortical area, cortical thickness, inverse relationship with cortical porosity, trabeculum number, tear SP, trabecular spacing, the space between the trabeculae, and here we have some inverse relationship. And those data in white with a star, those are the correlation which were positive, significantly, uh, statistically significant when the yogurt was related to the bone microstructure in this very homogeneous population of 68 years old women. Now, this uh, association, what about the intervention study? And here too, we have a large series of different trials looking at the effect of dairy products, milk, cheese, yogurt. And you see here, uh, to make the story short, all are positive. There is a decrease in bone turnover. There is a decrease of PTH with a protein intervention, and in two or three trials, there are some decrease in the loss of bone mass occurring with age. So all are more or less positive, and once again, in white, these are illustrated since the topic of today. Uh, the intervention was uh, comprising some soft cheese or fermented cheese and uh, yogurt as well, confirming that even if the level of significance is still to be to imp improve, there are some suggestions from randomized controlled trial that it's possible to see a positive effect of dairy products and uh, yogurt on the bone health in the uh, elderly people. But then, most of these trials were coming from Europe and some of Canada. And you know that from one country to the other, the content in protein and calcium depends on the country. In the upper part of the slide, you see the yogurt content here in the US as uh, provided by USDA National Nutrient Database. And you see that to have a yogurt probably palatable with a good consistency, there is some addition of uh, milk powder, and this could account for an increase nearly 50% in terms of calcium, 50% in terms of protein. Whereas in those trials in the lower part of the, uh, of the slide with yogurt coming from some French factories. In this case, this is plain 
milk, and there's nearly no enrichment. So from one country to the other, the interpretation of the data relating bone in response to dairy products and particularly yogurt should be uh, considered and taken into consideration. Then what about after the fracture? And we know that the patient with a hip fracture is particularly uh, protein deficient. The record was approximately 0.4 gram per kilogram of body weight. The RDA, as mentioned by the previous speaker, 0.8. Probably in the elderly, what is recommended is 1 to 1.2. And here, just by giving 20 grams of casein derivatives to these patients after the hip fracture over a six-month period, it was possible to prevent by 50% the decrease in bone mineral density at the contralateral uh, site uh, as compared with the fracture. And then if you look at what term of mechanism, we are coming back to the story of IGF-1. And here in two models of elderly patients with a high uh, probability of protein deficiency, on the left-hand side, there is a frail elderly in the, hospi in the geriatric hospital. Uh, they are very old. The oldest patient in this trial was 105 years old. And on the right-hand side, the patient with a hip fracture comparing the control, those receiving nothing, you see that it's possible already by one week, two weeks, three weeks, to see an increase in terms of IGF-1 in those patients receiving some 20 grams of a mixture, a whey protein, and essential amino acid. And finally, uh, I will not review all the story about the muscle, but since the connection uh, to lead to a fracture is a fall, muscle weakness, and osteoporosis uh, bone uh, strength degradation. You see here one of the trials which was referred to before on the left-hand side, a randomized control trial in the frail early, looking at the effect of milk protein on a composite evaluation of muscle uh, function, which is the SPPB, looking at the strengths, the gait speed, and the balance. And you see there was a significant increase in those patients receiving the the milk protein concentrate. And on the right hand side, looking at one of the component of the fracture risk, the falls, it was possible to demonstrate in this trial that, that milk protein plus a little bit vitamin D obviously and some counseling, this was associated with a lower risk of falling. So altogether, better bone, less bone loss, and less uh, falls, you could expect some reduction in the risk of fracture, but at the present time, we have no investigation, we have no strong data indicating that in a randomized tri trial, some dairy products or even yogurt derived protein are associated with less fracture. So in conclusion, uh, based on what you have seen before, despite the fact we have no systematic review, we have no meta-analysis on the topic, uh, in this uh, last issue of the guidance, European guidance in terms of management of osteoporosis, we took the step to say, well, we have some recommendation in terms of calcium, vitamin D, and proteins, but maybe it's so difficult to achieve this recommendation, maybe we should recommend the use of fortified fermented dairy products to help to have enough protein, enough calcium, and enough vitamin D, and despite the limitation I was referring to before, it's written, it's published last year in an issue of Osteoporosis International. So maybe the use of fermented dairy products to allow the elderly patient to have enough calcium, vitamin D, and protein uh, should be considered as well. Thank you very much.